Hello all, I'm Lark Mason, past chairman of Asia Week, and welcome to the art of installation and display. Today we have some of the art world's luminaries in that field joining us today, Anugash Mazumdar, Bill Stender, Ranjit Singh, and Sandra Nunnally are going to make a presentation showing particular aspects of this subject. The program today begins with the presentation of each of our participants, followed by a question and answer period. During the program, you're welcome to submit your questions to our panelists, and we will address those as it goes forward. I also encourage you to participate in other webinars and events scheduled throughout the year through Asia Week. And you can do that by becoming a subscriber. Go to the Asia Week website and you can keep abreast of the many different programs that we offer. And without further ado, welcome our, I would like you to welcome our speakers as I give you an introduction for each. Anu has been with Sotheby's since 2003, where she was appointed to be the director of Sotheby's Indian and Southeast Asian Works of Art Department. She is a specialist, not just in the classical field, but also classical, modern, and contemporary. And she works with um, Sotheby sales of Indian, Himalayan, Southeast Asian, modern and contemporary art, not just in New York, but internationally, Europe and Asia. She has set landmark records um, in this field, including the Richard and Magdalena Ernst collection, the estate of Dr. Klaus Birch, uh, most recently, a collection of Mughal and Ottoman textiles from the estate of Peter Stern. She lectures widely, and it's always a joy to hear her speak, and she participates in private and international forums. Sandra Nunnally is the founder and creative director of a company, a multidisciplinary studio in New York City that bears her name. She explores the intersection of art and design. And she is a native of New Zealand. She creates these beautifully edited environments that have a timeless sophistication. And after you see them, I'm sure you'll agree that that is the best way to describe them. She has a range of projects she's worked on from metropolitan residences in large cities such as New York, Hong Kong, Berlin, to re private retreats in Aspen or the Hamptons. She's been named to the prestigious AD 100 list in the US and Architectural Digest France. And she appears in publications as diverse as Departures, El Decor, and the Financial Times. She has collaborations with co other companies, including the Rug Company. Uh, she has a furniture series she works with Maison Girard on, has published monographs, art written articles, has written a book, which is uh, going to be supplemented by another. So welcome to, um, and now welcome to Ranjit Singh, dealer in Asian antique arms and armor based in Royal Lemington Spa, which is in Warwickshire. He's been a specialist in the field of arms and armor since 1991 and 1999 and has considerable experience and is a participant, one of our valued members of Asia Week and he exhibits in other locations internationally. He has an enthusiasm for his area that is uh, infectious, you'll agree again after you hear his talk, and produces the most beautiful catalogs and installations you could imagine. He carefully researches and uh, selects the items for not only their beauty, but their provenance, and loves to share that history that follows each of these items. He provides advice, consultation, works with private collectors, institutions, and museums. And our other panelist is William Stender, founder of 1031, a diversified company that offers a range of services to collectors, museums, and other institutions. He takes the initial design and then he runs with that and comes up with the plan that would best uh, suit the works of art that require display. I've known Bill for 36 years, and that's the length of time he's been working in this field, and he's, he's really got a terrific knowledge. Without further ado, our first speaker of the day is Anu, and we welcome her. Anu? Hello, 
Good evening. Thank you, Lark, for the introduction. Thank you, Asia Week New York, for inviting me to speak today. Greetings to our audience and a very warm hello to my fellow panelists. My name is Anu Ghosh Mazumdar, and I head the Indian and Southeast Asian Art Department at Sotheby's. In my 17-year auction career, I've had the great good fortune to handle, install, and display some masterpieces myself. At other times, I've had a privileged insider's view into the installation and display of masterpieces handled by colleagues in other departments at Sotheby's. Every artwork, whether it is an object or a sculpture or a painting of ancient or medieval or modern date, is unique. And so the nature of the object itself guides its exhibition. In equal measure, a great deal of planning, which is unseen by viewers, goes into every display. What I hope to share with you this evening is a taste of some of my experiences and learnings of the different issues that come into play in handling and exhibiting art. Next slide, please. Practical considerations in installation. This majestic and monumental sculpture of the Buddha was the highlight of my very first auction at Sotheby's in March 2004. Many in the audience are probably familiar with Gandharan art. For those who are not, this is a particular genre of Buddhist art that was created in the northwestern part of the South Asian subcontinent during the early centuries of the Common Era. This area, which lay at the crossroads of the overland silk routes, witnessed an efflorescence of Buddhist culture during this early period. Gandharan art is characterized by a meeting of Eastern and Western artistic traditions. Most Gandharan sculptures are made of schist, which is a very dense and heavy stone. This particular Buddha, which is 63 inches tall, was both massive and voluminous. It weighed all of 1,393 pounds. To move, install, and display such a heavy sculpture in our galleries presented a challenge. And to do the job properly and safely, we had to embrace the structure of our building itself. Sotheby's building on York Avenue, where I'm speaking from right now, is 10 stories tall and was raised on a structure supported by pillars of poured concrete. On every floor of the building, wherever the rebar meets those pillars, there is additional reinforcement. Given the enormous weight of the sculpture, we were advised that any time we placed it on any floor for display, it had to be in an area where the floor had additional strength and could withstand the stress of this massive weight. So that was a factor that featured in our installation plan. And you can see in the display image on the right that the Buddha is in close proximity to one of these pillars. Additionally, to show off this beautiful sculpture to its best advantage, the then head of department and I decided that we wanted saffron scrims to frame the sculpture from behind, which you can also see in the picture. Saffron is a color which is ubiquitous in this part of the world and also closely associated with Buddhism. The silk cloth used to make the scrims was purchased in India, the scrims were stitched in India, and they were shipped here. I then had to go through many proper channels to make sure that they were fireproofed before they could be installed. So there were many learnings from that first pre-auction display. In a happy conclusion to all the hard work, the sculpture sold for $736,000, which remained a world auction record for Gandharan art for some time. Next slide, please. Creating an impact in installation. From one of the largest and heaviest objects that I've ever handled, I will speak about one of the smallest and most precious sculptures that I've ever seen. The Guanol Lioness at center, created in ancient Mesopotamia over 4,000 years ago, is arguably one of the most important ancient Near Eastern sculptures in existence. This masterpiece of world art was offered for sale by my colleagues in our ancient sculpture department in 2007. This tiny three and one fourth inches tall crystalline limestone object, that big, is believed to have had ritual significance and was probably worn as a pendant by somebody very important when it was made. Despite its small size, this object has an impact which is transcendental. The powerful frontal stance and the bold modeling imbue this tiny sculpture with a monumentality that is hard to describe. And so our exhibition designer, Rush Jenkins, went to work to showcase exactly that, the power packed punch of the lioness. He designed one of the most dramatic displays that I've ever seen. Our cavernous 10th floor galleries with their 20 foot high ceilings were darkened. In one of those galleries, Rush created a temple-like setting, our version of the Temple of Dendur. The lioness photographed beautifully and various views of the sculpture were reproduced on floor length screens suspended from the ceiling of the gallery, 
to create a kind of enclosure. Encased within the screens was a wall structure approximating the sanctum of a temple. And in the center, glowing like a jewel inside a glass case, was the lioness. An unforgettable display for an unforgettable object, which went on to sell for the unforgettable price of $57 million. Next slide, please. Handling and care in installation. When we look at large and complex contemporary art installations, the word fragile is probably not the first one that comes to mind. And yet that was the most important consideration in handling this particular installation created by contemporary Indian artist Chintan Upadhyay. This was offered in a modern and contemporary South Asian art sale in September 2007. New Indians, the title of the installation, comprised 33 sculptures depicting babies balanced on wooden bases. The sculptures were fashioned out of fiberglass, but the gold surfaces were not painted on. Rather, a covering of gold leaf was applied and burnished by hand on the surface of every single one of these works. It took the artist a very long time to create this piece, and right before it went on display at Sotheby's, he arrived from India. He spent three days checking the surface of every single one of these babies, addressing light scarves or scratches to the gold leaf, which may have occurred during transportation from India. When the display was set up, literally every single one of these was handled with kid gloves. The installation sold for about $530,000 and was then put away carefully until the purchasers could send their shipper to pick up their new acquisition. On the day that the pickup was meant to happen, I wasn't in the office. My department administrator later told me that she received a phone call from our colleague in the Sotheby's outbound dock. She went downstairs to find that the shipper, a very nice gentleman, had arrived with a large truck and some blankets. His plan was to load the babies into the truck, cover them up with the blankets if need be, drive the truck to his warehouse, pack the sculptures, and then send it along to the destination. Upon hearing this, my colleagues, to whom I will be eternally grateful, took an executive decision then and there and decided they were not going to release the work to the shipper that day. They sent him away, informed me, and subsequently we made arrangements for a proper art shipper to pack these works and transport them. Eventually, the installation reached its new owner in good shape, all thanks to two people whose quick thinking averted what might have been a very different outcome with these artworks. Next slide, please experiencing an installation. One of the most beautiful and immersive displays that I've ever seen anywhere was one organized at Sotheby's in 2013 by my colleagues in our 20th century design department. Leila Lan, The Poetry of Sculpture was a selling exhibition co-curated by the late Mr. Paul Kassman and Michael Shaw. The exhibition was designed by Reed Krakow and offered viewers a glimpse into the magical, surreal world of the sculptors Claude and François Xavier Lalanne. Works by Lalanne are universally loved for their playfulness. And so the exhibition designer created a midnight garden setting in which the 36 works selected for the show were displayed. Visitors to the galleries here in our building on bustling York Avenue were transported into a different realm when they set foot into the space. It was as though you had fallen through the looking glass and landed with a bump in Wonderland. This dreamscape was created with the help of carefully constructed topiary, which provided the perfect setting for display. Amongst the many unusual features of the exhibition was the presence of a gardener who came in every day to check on the plants. I can tell you that for the three week duration of this show, I was one of many visitors who came into the galleries to experience the exhibition and try and find a quantum of solace in the middle of a busy day. Science and installation. Next slide, please. In January this year, my colleagues in Sotheby's Master Paintings Department handled one of the rarest treasures that has ever been featured in any auction. Sandro Botticelli's portrait of a young man holding a rounder was the highlight of the season. Works by this artist can only be found in museums and rarely if ever come up for sale anywhere. So it goes without saying that transportation, handling and display of the painting had to be very carefully planned. In December 2020, there was a window of opportunity to exhibit this work in Dubai. Here you can see the painting on view in Sotheby's Dubai galleries with its first visitors, the Minister for Tourism and Culture and a member of the royal family. The arrangements that were made for this display were amongst the most elaborate I've ever known. And I'm grateful to my colleagues who worked on this project for sharing some of those details with me. The painting is made on a wooden panel, which is an organic material. 
And so in transporting this to a very hot and humid climate, temperature and relative humidity were the two aspects that had to be managed. The packaging, transportation, installation, and deinstallation plan were created by a group of colleagues led by Jamie Martin, world famous forensic researcher who heads Sotheby's scientific research lab. Next slide, please. For the transportation of this painting, a custom temperature and humidity controlled crate was designed. You can see that on the far left. Uh, it looks like an armored crate. Within it, an inner crate was nested, also with temperature and humidity control. The painting was placed inside the inner crate and then both crates were sealed. The temperature inside both crates was set at between 67 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit and the relative humidity or RH was set at between 45 and 55 percent. This is the ideal climate within which this painting should remain and so it traveled within that microclimate. Sensors were placed within both crates and a custom app was built and downloaded on the smartphones of the handlers who would be uncreating the painting. When the phone was placed alongside the crate, it gave a reading of the temperature and humidity inside. Now the normal temperature in Dubai is 90 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the RH is at 100%. So the thermostat in the galleries there was turned on well before this crate ever reached Dubai. By the time it reached the Sotheby's galleries there, the temperature and RH had lowered, but they were still not level with the microclimate inside the crates. So the crate sat there for another three days with temperature and humidity being constantly checked. When the readings in the gallery and inside the crate were at level with each other, the crate was opened. After exhibition, the same process was followed to seal the crates and send the painting back to New York. My colleagues who worked on this project described it as an exercise in patience and in character building, and I'm sure I agree with them. This masterpiece went on to sell for $92 million at auction. I'll end my carousel of anecdotes here. I hope I've been able to convey above all the tireless planning and effort of scores of professionals who work behind the scenes so that we, the viewers, can enjoy and admire art in both safe conditions and in gorgeous creative displays. Before I end, I will say that sharing these reminiscences brought back many happy memories. I hope it won't be too long before all of us can go back to viewing and browsing the art that we love in galleries, fairs, exhibitions, and in Asia Week, New York. Thank you. Are we on? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Stender and I'm president of 1031 Incorporated. And uh, we've been in the business for 36 years of mount making and display. I started in 1985 uh, in uh, going up and down Madison Avenue in a small van, meeting all the dealers and collectors in that area. Back in the day, uh, Willie Wolf still had a gallery on Madison Avenue. And when I walked in to see Willie uh, and introduced myself, he looked at me and said, I think you'll be my last one. And I asked him what that meant. And he said, well, I've outlived three other mount makers. I don't think I'll outlive you. Uh, over the years, we've grown to a company now where we have uh, four different companies and design contracts, and we manufacture five different product lines. We're going to discuss different mount styles, different installation styles, and different museum products we've done over the years. Starting with the uh, drilling and sleeving, it's a thing when I started uh, in this business, the typical way to drill a stone head would be just to drill it and set it on a post or to glue the post into the object. Uh, instead, I developed a technique where we, in, we insert an internally dimensioned brass sleeve into the artifact. This allows us to float the object and not have any grinding of the stone against the post, or worse yet, having a post sticking out of the object at all times, and you can't really just hold the object without a post sticking out of it. Um, over the years, uh, this has worked very well for all sized objects. 
As we moved on, we also find we have larger stone artifacts that are more of a flat panel type. We can't necessarily drill and sleeve them, so we'll have to add armatures and brackets to the back of the stone. And this brings up another point. Now we'll be bending and forming the steel or brass to the back of the object and screwing into the back. And it might seem odd to be drilling and sleeving or screwing into art. But over the years, um, I've maintained it is better to alter an artistically unimportant surface, such as a broken area or a back, than to add a clip or a bracket to an artistically front surface if you can avoid it. How big can we get with this technique? Well, this uh, artifact is over 2,000 pounds. It's presently sitting in the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. And this uh, pedestal, bronze pedestal, shows another technique that we've developed over the years. And this is what I call a pallet jack pocket pedestal. Now, this pedestal will allow you to remove the front edge of it and then uh, insert a pallet jack and move the object around using that technique. Uh, this is another uh, stone object where we did posts up the back of the object in order to mount it. Now this is over seven foot by seven foot artifact and we were able to uh, install this in three pieces for Christie's last year. Another type of mount making technique is an inleted base. So these bases are inleted to fit the bottom of the objects. Here's another one where we made not only the inleted parts to hold the pieces, but we made wooden substructure to replicate the uh, horse carriage or the, the ox carriage. Made this for an old dealer from the 80s, an Augustine Chen from China House of Arts. Here's another project we did. Uh, this is also inleted, but in a different fashion. It's much deeper and longer to, again, hide an artistically unimportant part of the sculpture, the tenon or tang section of the sculpture. And these will be cut out in layers and formed and fitted and molded to hold the object. Now, we can't do any of those, we'll move on to armatures. Now, armatures are used to hold a bracket and hold an object and obviously float it uh, up above its base. Uh, this bronze piece uh, was large and actually it was very interesting on both sides. So we went about and we actually painted out the armature to match the sculpture on both sides. Armatures can be very technically difficult. Some of the most difficult objects to mount are actually natural history object. This is a dolphin skull, and uh, it's very difficult to grab and hold because of the natural shapes and tendencies of it. How big can we get with these? Uh, well, this is a 400 pound stone ammonite panel. Uh, the brackets made to support it in many places and spread the load out across the wall. So we're able to hold 400 pounds on a drywall style wall. Uh, this armature was to hold a 3,000 pound meteorite. It went to auction down in uh, Texas at Heritage. Um, the ultimate goal here was to try to make the piece look floating as much as possible. And how tall can we get? Well, you can see that uh, scissor lift with me on the top, this was over 25 feet tall. Ultimately, this uh, mounting bracket was used outdoors on a concrete pad up in a hillside, uh, all stainless steel treated to keep the piece as safe as possible. Now we'll get into some installation and gallery work we've done over the years. Um, as I my business grew from just a mount making business, we'd have customers come to us and ask us to install the pieces as well. So uh, it would start with private clients asking us to make acrylic cases and bracketing and then go ahead and install them. This is a UV acrylic case with a special tubular bracket to hold a textile. Another technique we developed over the years was a way to float an articulated screen in such a way as to not damage it. 
a lot of times we found these types of screens had been held up in a way that there was literally tearing the paper hinges apart. So we developed a technique to support the entire screen at the bottom in an articulated fashion. And yet when it's all installed, you really don't see anything. We then took this technique that we did for many years and actually upsized it for a large wooden lacquer style screen. Uh, this was an installation we did for the designer Ellie Coleman. This is a project we did for Diane Abbey and she has a beautiful collection of Japanese baskets that have been given to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, this is a piece of her collection at her uh, home in Southampton that we installed for her so that she could live with the art. And I think that's a very important thing when we look at what we're doing here is trying to find a harmonious way to live with the art. I actually had one very prominent Asian art dealer tell me once that my job was humbling. And I asked, why was that? And he said, well, when you've done your job right, no one notices. And I think that's been a mantra for me for many years. I don't want to be doing and making very showy things. I want the art to shine through. Uh, we've done a lot of corporate work as well. We helped install the initial Bellagio Las Vegas, made art armatures, brackets, and bases all through the casino. Uh, we did a lot of gallery work over the years. This is Carlton Rochelle's gallery on the, in the Fuller Building on 57th Street uh, during some of the first Asia weeks ever. Uh, we helped design the layouts, pedestals, armatures, brackets, and did the entire installation with Carlton. Further, we also worked with Jim Lally for many years, pretty much from the day he started his gallery on a dining room table in his Park Avenue apartment up until he closed last month or two months ago. Uh, we helped design and build these display cases. We did all his mount making and installation over the years. And he is a force in the Asian art market that will be dearly missed. Help Jim uh, design, install, and uh, set up his uh, Paris Biennale exhibit. And we went with a nice color scheme here, kind of following um, Anu's uh, saffron concept, uh, and we went with some nice colors to offset the art. This is Joan Mervis, uh, Asia Week booth. This is the first Asia Week. Uh, booth uh, worked, we built this with a designer uh, and we've maintained and installed this for Joan probably for over 15 years. Uh, it's great to um, uh, continue to work with her on this booth and continue to reconfigure it almost every year for her. Uh, we also do a lot of custom cabinetry style uh, displays. So these uh, are custom jewelry cases made for Hancock's of London in Sherry and Ebony. Then we get on to some museum. And again, as we continued to grow, museums came to us and asked for our expertise. Uh, this is the National Firearms Museum. We've worked for them for over 25 years. Matter of fact, I got a phone call for them to, from them today, renovating a section and they're adding another 400 firearms. This is the 9-11 Memorial Museum in Manhattan. Uh, what we did here was we did all the hardened mounts. These are all the mounts for artifacts that are not behind glass. Uh, so these would not allow you to lift or remove the artifacts. And then we also made the large all glass case for the last existing architectural model of the Trade Center. This is Annapolis History Museum. Again, all the armatures and brackets. Jamestown Arcarium, all the armatures and brackets. The Pat Museum of Leadership in Fort Knox. We uh, were able to do all the display cases for this museum, as well as some of the specific armature making, uh, specifically that ivory handled pistols of, of patents. This was a fun project that uh, was, we were told couldn't be done. Uh, the designer called me and said, I want to cantilever glass boxes out of the wall. And I've been told it can't be done. And that's all I need to hear. And uh, we started working out uh, design and engineering styles. And ultimately, we were able to take these boxes and mount them into the wall sideways. And this is laminated safety glass 
fabricated in Germany and shipped to Colorado Springs. And finally, over the years, as we've grown, we started making products. Uh, we have a website, artdisplay.com, and we may, there we have stock products that both collectors, dealers, and museums use throughout the world. Part of this has to do with designing new products. My son, Evan Stender, is now part of the business. He has a degree in industrial design, and he's making some great new products that museums are using all over the world. This is the product called Q-Cord. This is a retractable art stanchion and queuing system. Uh, it's the world's smallest diameter retractable queuing system. And uh, we manufacture that right here in New Jersey and it's shipped all over the world. We also make art stanchions. These are the low art stanchions, corded art stanchion ours. They are very unique in that the top cap is not removable or lost. We have the Museum Rails product. This is a product that is modular and reusable. So it's used everything, everywhere from very small uh, historical societies up to major institutions. We also have our Museum Signs product line. And this is a very small profile, neat, clean, architecturally, uh, clean product that's used again all over the world. And then our even smaller museum signs. Uh, and these are small signage plates that can easily print on your own printers and again used throughout uh, the world. And I thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions later on. Good afternoon. Oh, good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you to Asia Week New York for inviting me to take part in this fascinating discussion. Uh, my name is Ranjit Singh, and I am an antiques dealer from the UK, from the town of Royal Levington Spa. Sorry, I just skipped too far. Um, from the small town of Royal Lemington Spa in the county of Warwickshire in England. Um, Royal Lemington Spa, so you can place it geographically, is about 120 uh, kilometres north of London um, and about 15 kilometres east of Stratford-upon-Avon, which maybe some of you have visited um, and it's best known for being the birthplace of Shakespeare. Um, I'm going to be talking to you this evening about the display and installation of arms and armour um, the origins in world history um, and for the purposes of this presentation I'm going to be concentrating on the Indian tradition. The earliest references, uh, uh, references of displaying arms and armour come from the Greek and Roman practice of removing the arms and armour from your defeated opponent and making an offering to the gods um, and shown here is a Roman denarius from the British Museum um, and in the center, you can see a mannequin of armor, um, either side a spear, uh, and then either side of that, two oblong shields. And below, um, two sacrifices, human sacrifices of a, a man and a woman with their arms bound. Um, and into early modern Europe, um, the practice continues um, with this print by Daniel Hopfer. Um, and we can see uh, victory and history personified left and right. Um, and the Lord Jupiter, the God Jupiter, um, in the form of an eagle. Um, and you can see a quiver full of arrows and uh, bows, spears, and on the ground, a stack of shields. Later, the British adopt the tradition of making trophies of arms and armor to display British military prowess. And that tradition lasts from around 1700 to the mid 20th century. Our particular re relevance to the presentation to this presentation is the British display of those arms purchased, gifted, or captured in India, such as the numerous items gifted to King Edward VII, then the Prince of Wales, 
on his grand tour of India in 1875. And many of those objects now cover the walls of um, great British uh, royal houses. Um, for example, this photograph um, from the Royal Collection um, shows Sandringham uh, House, the Queen's personal residence and summer retreat. Um, and you can see the ballroom walls covered in um, those objects. And a close up from uh, the rare um, publication by Purden Clark um, from 1910, which I believe has been reprinted, um, so may be available. Um, but you can see those Indian arms and armor uh, displayed on a very fetching Victorian wallpaper. Um, the martial races of India worship weapons. The Sikhs believe the sword represents Ard Shakti, the primordial power of God. Um, and Shasta Puja, weapon worship, is performed to ensure victory on the battlefield. The Hindus believe in a more somatic way that the sword is the goddess, or, and through Shasta Puja, the goddess will enter the sword and ensure victory on the battlefield. And that practice continues into other aspects of life in India. For example, if a vehicle is bought, a new car, then a small ceremony takes place and it's hoped the goddess will enter the car and the owner will have many safe miles on the road. The ancient tradition of weapon display in India doesn't seem to have been studied in any great depth, but the practice still continues, as I've told you. And this photograph is from a Sikh place of worship, Gurdwara. Um, and this particular site is known as Hazur Sahib in Nanded in the state of Maharashtra. And it shows a classical arrangement of Shasta uh, weapons in the form which this tradition says is a lotus flower. And the lotus flower in ancient Indian Dharma represents order from chaos. The Sikh tradition of weapon display is likely to have started with the sixth Sikh Guru, uh, 1595 to 1644, and his militarization of the Sikhs following the persecution and execution of the fifth guru by the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. And here's another image from the same Gurdwara. And in the background, you can see the Sangat, the congregation, um, come to have uh, darshan, um, holy site of the weapons. And uh, two photographs of the, uh, of the Hindu tradition on the left, some ladies performing uh, Shasta Puja to a group of weapons in Bikaneer. And on the right, we see again the lotus uh, arrangement um, in Rajasthan. The modern display of arms and armor in art settings by museum dealers and collectors loosely follows what has been done previously with the traditions that I've talked about. And the shape, as we can see here in the Im this image taken at the Queen's Gallery, Buckingham Palace, incidentally follows that lotus flower arrangement. One of the most stark differences that I found is the displaying of a sword. In traditional displays, a sword is normally placed flat with the tip away. And in modern displays, we seem to display the tip facing down. In this way, the sword becomes non-threatening and allows them to be being seen as standalone works of art. It also often accentuates the sculptural form. And in this photograph, a 19th century Susan Butter sword from Rajasthan is displayed in the modern manner and the graceful blade brought to the attention of the viewer. The triple bend in the blade is also found in Indian classical art and dance and is known as the Tribunga as is seen with the 16th century bronze figure of Parvati from the Metropolitan Museum. I cannot end without mentioning an exhibition I took part in as part of Asia Week New York in March 2019. I worked with Paris-based artist decorator Dorian Guo, and the concept of the exhibition was that Dorian was shown a group of my mainly Indian and Chinese arms and armor, and he would create art and a wallpaper to provide backdrop for those, uh, to provide a backdrop for those items. This ceremonial helmet from the Qing dynasty in China on the left was displayed against the background of these uh, Chinese entwined dragons. 
Um, interestingly, those Chin very Chinese looking dragons actually took influence from the Indian dagger on the right hand side where you have two uh, South Indian Yali dragons. Um, and another application was this 18th century shield from Mehrwar, Rajasthan. And it was displayed against a custom designed wallpaper, which took elements from the design of the shield. And Dorian designed this very French trois de jouy wallpaper. And I'm very pleased to say the shield went to a collector in New York, who was also um, displayed it against the custom made wallpaper. It has been said to me that my exhibitions are serene and peaceful, which seems remarkable because of the subject matter. But we must remember that these objects can have complex spiritual significance. And I believe that if they are displayed with the appreciation of the form and design, they can be viewed for the stunning works of art they truly are. Thank you for listening and I welcome any questions. Good evening. My name is Sandra Nunnally. Uh, I'm the creative director of my namestake firm, Sandra Nunnally. I run a studio in New York City. Um, many of my clients, oh, next slide, please. Thank you. Many of my clients come to me with various collections. For Asia Week New York, I selected a series of photographs of Asian art and furniture. These are pieces of, that we have worked with over the years with our clients, and we put them into their residential homes and into their, into their into settings where they can enjoy them, where they don't feel as though they're living in an art gallery, where they don't feel as though they're living in a museum. What we try to do, we try them to bring them into the home, so they harmonize with our client's lifestyle. This first photograph that I selected is actually um, of a, a Chinese contemporary ink painting by Lu Dan. And this is actually in my own living room in Manhattan. I commissioned Lu um, to, to create this for me in 2013 and it's called Cloud Route 3. Next slide, please. After hanging the Lou Dan for a year, I kept thinking, oh, it really doesn't look that great on those beige walls. So I came up with this blue slate gray color and the Chinese contemporary ink just, oh, it just, it sung um, against those walls. So, um, by doing that, it humanized it. It, it. it didn't become so intimidating, but at the same time, you could still very, very much enjoy it in that setting. Next slide, please. This is another Lu Dan. This one's called Spirit Stone. And I purchased this from the Chinese corporate, the Chinese porcelain co company, uh, Khalil Risk, who was um, who owned the Chinese porcelain company, who very, very sadly died at the very young age of 49, was a great mentor to, to me. And he actually introduced me to Lou Dan when Lou was living and working in New York. And I kept up that relationship with Lou um, after Khalil passed away. And I would visit Lou in Beijing and continue to work with him um, actually with a client of mine in Hong Kong who was also a collector of his work. So I'm a great fan of Lou and this also, uh, this, this contemporary ink also works against those blue slate walls. And I put it with a centifu bird that I collected um, from the Ivory Coast. And I just love that contradiction of that that, that wonderful rock actually that I often sit, sit in front of and meditate with that Senefu bird. Next collection, please. Next slide, thank you. 
Now, this is another Chinese contemporary ink. It's by Tai Sanju. Tai was actually mentored by um, Lu Dan, and Lu Dan, of course, being the master. And Tai's gone on to create uh, some wonderful uh, works of art. Right now, he's being uh, represented by Paul Kasman in New York. And here I placed it in my apartment once again with a genere um, chaise longue and a pair of um, tables. We are designing uh, a collection of tables for the art gallery Maison Gerard in New York. And it's just showing once again, you know, that Asian art doesn't have to be put in a setting where you feel as though you're living in a museum or a gallery. You know, here it works wonderfully in this corner of this living room with all of these different components. Next slide, please. This is another uh, Chinese contemporary ink by Tai Sanzhou. And this I purchased from the Chinese porcelain gallery. Actually, Khalil Risk was the one that actually had the first exhibit of uh, Tai's work. And this was the first time I saw it. And this was an earlier one. And this one's called Beautiful Sharp Peaks. And this one was done in 2011. Originally, I had also hung this on beige walls and it just didn't sing. But when I, when I came up with this color, which I named Bitter Chocolate, it just works so, so beautifully in my study. Next slide, slide please. I work around the world from you know, Berlin to Hong Kong to France to New Zealand, my home country, and you know, to, and to various spots in, in the United States. This was a ski house that I worked on in Aspen, Colorado, and it had a contemporary setting. Next slide, please. And within this camp contemporary setting, I placed this um, artwork um, as also as an ink and acrylic on paper by Jean Jean Bing and uh, dated 2011. So showing that you know it works so well within this contemporary setting. Next slide please. In the same house in the same Aspen Chalet we placed at the end of this long corridor, a um, Chinese contemporary ink painting by Chen Feng, who is represented by Pace Gallery. And it's had such impact, just having this one piece at the end of the wall. I didn't want to have any other art piece, just this one particular one. So showing once again, how well it works in a contemporary setting. Next slide, please. The, one, the photograph on the right is a Khmer sculpture. Actually, William Stender made this base for this sculpture. I also bought this from uh, Khalil Risk at Chinese Porcelain. It was the first exhibit um, of Khmer that uh, Chinese Porcelain had, and I was lucky enough to be able to purchase this beautiful piece. And this is also in my living room. And it was before I actually painted the room that blue gray. I've moved this piece around a lot. It's no longer in my living room, but I do that with a lot of my collection. Um, I, I'll, I'll take place it in the bedroom, or I may even place it in the powder room. I mean, fine art should not just have to be placed in the entry or a living room. It can be placed in 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 small, you know intimate spots where one can view it, view it carefully. On the left is a photograph by an, a young contemporary American uh, photographer, Rena Bass Foreman. She's represented by uh, Winston Watford Fine Art here in New York. And this is titled Buddha in the Snow. And this just very much appealed to me, especially with the uh, snakeskin fireplace below it. Next slide, please. This is a, uh, this bed was actually um, 
this bear is actually in an apartment in New York City on Park Avenue, but my clients were living in Hong Kong at the time and were being transferred back to New York. And she said, look, we've slept in this bed for all the years we've slept in Hong Kong and we want to bring it back to New York. Will you make it work? And I said, absolutely. And here it is. It's still on Park Avenue. They still sleep in it. And of course, we place this wonderful uh, figure of uh, Matisse. Uh, so it has that wonderful sort of feeling of languor. Next slide, please. This is my own bedroom. It's a very personal space. And one of the reasons I, I placed this photograph in this presentation was because of the fabric. It's a fabric actually made by Scalamandre. Scalamandre, I'm sure you're aware, is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, fabric houses in America. I think they did the original curtains for the White House. I collect vintage fabrics when I travel. And this one I found here in the United States is actually um, a Chinese ancient town. And just the way this that's woven, the way it's expressed in the silk, it just has a beautiful feeling and just adds another layer to this personal space. Next slide, please. These photographs are taken. I did a horse farm for a client um, on Chesapeake Bay, um, and they have a collection of Oriental art. The I I love um, you know reverse paintings on glass, and here are two beautiful examples. The monkeys are Japanese. Um, they are from the 1890s, and I just like very much how they work with their silver collection. Next slide, please. This bookcase I purchased from Jerry Bland. He's a dealer here in New York City. It's spotted bamboo. It's a spotted bamboo and lacquer uh, bookcase, Chinese, mid 19th century. But instead of placing uh, Chinese uh, ceramics, I place Swedish and Norwegian uh, ceramics. And I, I very, very much like that contradiction. Working with Asian pieces, I'll often contradict it with contemporary art or Norwegian pottery, so that there is a, a dialogue that goes on that is, that is, that is modern and, and allows us to live the way we do today. So I do hope you've enjoyed these few photographs. and. Um, I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you. And we'll begin our question and answer. We've received some questions from our audience. And uh, as soon as we have some images appearing up on the screen, we'll begin. But one of the things that I've noticed, that I noticed about all of the presentations was the extraordinary amount of creativity that was present in um, solving problems and coming to solutions and showing items to their very best advantage. And so I'm going to begin our Q&A as everyone is popping up. And Sandra, I'm going to ask you the, to respond first, but each of our panelists to, to respond. Um, for someone that is at home who has a work of art right now, and they don't really want to engage a professional, but they're looking for tips on how to safely and uh, show an object and show it to the very best advantage? Or there's some very simple kind of basic tips that you can provide from your perspective? Well, it depends on what you're collecting, all right, and, and what, what the piece of art is. Um, I think framing, of course, is a very important ingredient. So if you bring home a piece of art and the frame does not work within the room, I think that's one of the first things one should address. All right. 
um, that can make all the difference in the world. And as I said earlier, um, a lot of my clients, when they have a piece of art, they think, oh goodness, we've got to put it in the drip, in the living room. We've got to put it in the entry so that people can see it and enjoy it when they come in. Most people today live, they'll live in their kitchens or their uh, great rooms, or they'll live in other areas of the house. Don't be frightened to place the art in these places so that when you are sitting at your kitchen table, you can look up every day and see a beautiful piece of art and it'll, maybe it'll just set your day off in the right direction. I think that's great advice. Ranjit, how about you? Uh, funnily enough, I'm actually, um, I'm refurbishing my house at the moment. So this is a subject very much on my mind. And it's probably why I've got the most boring backdrop from out of all of the panelists is because I'm in a little cupboard uh, in the basement of the house. And I, I feel a little bit like Harry Potter. Um, but uh, I think in terms of displaying artworks, um, I think uh, if they're kind of portable objects like a lot of mine are or, or works of art, as opposed to 2D printed works, then um, you need to think about speaking to somebody like Bill. And I know Bill said he has he has a, a website where you can just kind of click and buy um, and, and securing the object um, uh, and putting it where, um, as Sandra has said, you're gonna enjoy it. Um, I think that's really important. I know. Well, I will actually um, kind of echo what uh, both uh, Sandra and Ranjit have uh, have mentioned. And, uh, you know, I will share uh, a little story here. The most important thing is to be able to enjoy the work, number one. Number two, sometimes even unexpected situations can, you know, create an environment where you can enjoy the artwork in very surprising ways. Um, and as I'm saying this, I'm remembering, uh, we had sold a Tibetan painting, a very rare and old Tibetan painting, a tanka, to a collector in 2006. Uh, this was in excess of $250,000. It was expensive and it was their first very expensive purchase uh, of a Tibetan painting. Uh, such works must never be placed in direct sunlight. And so they found the perfect spot for it in their bedroom on a wall. Uh, where it would receive ambient light from outside, but where they would be able to look at it and enjoy it every day, just like Sandra was mentioning. Um, somehow, given the disposition of their home, the window of this room, and the way in which light came into that room, the painting had a different effect or a different feel uh, in the first morning light, in the afternoon, and then in the dusk, in the evening. And whenever they looked at it during the different times of day, they picked out different details in the painting. Um, and so this isn't something that they had planned for, but it's something that was unexpected and it actually enhanced their enjoyment of the painting. And it still sits there and they still continue to enjoy it all these years later. Bill. Oh. That's a loaded question, I'll say. Uh, there's a lot there. Um, you know, the, the first thought there is the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. I think people too often try to overthink the display of objects in their homes. Um, I'll go into a client and they'll want to put an acrylic case or just everything in a display case. And I said, you have to live with this. And he said, but this one's so special. I said, well, let's put that in a case because that'll tell people, again, using the case as a visual cue, I'm special. Um, but you, you've got to be careful that you want to live with the art and live in harmony with the art. Uh, so the simplicity, the, um, you know, again, going back to if, if, I, if you walk into a room and say, what a lovely pedestal, uh, I failed. Um, and so we try not to make pedestals uh, too, uh, go, period. And the only times we don't do that, or we do actually try to go with period things, is we get into the area of medieval inter-Renaissance, where 
the original objects had a highly designed ornamental base that went with them. And now we want to try to match up or key up to that uh, same cue that was done historically for the object. I really enjoyed Ranjit's uh, presentation about historical presentation. Uh, very often we don't do those things, but it's really nice to play off of those concepts from time to time. And I've got, well, I have another, this is from one of our, uh, probably a curator in the audience, who's putting together an exhibition of uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, but for their home. And they're trying to figure out how do they display these. So how do you do, how would any of you tackle that one? We're in a world of digital art now. You know, how masterpieces that we see in a gallery or in an auction house or, you know, in a dealer's exhibition can be brought into our space that we live in and needs to be relatable. Um, and, you know, such, such great tips on how to actually live with that and enjoy it. Uh, as far as the NFT question is concerned, I'm no expert on NFTs, but auction houses are selling NFTs increasingly, so it's an important part of our business. Um, I also know the person who's asked that question, and he is as naughty as he is lovable. So I, I think that I think that you know this was this was just a fun little question. Um, the NFT itself is a non fungible token. It's a receipt of your ownership of a digital work of art. Now artists have been creating digital art for more than two decades. Exactly. So how do you display digital art? You can you know own it and display it on your computer screen. If some artists um, are okay with it, and if they permit, you can print out the digital art and you can frame it and display it. But these are very specific things. And you know, I think that you need to check with the artist or whichever portal you've acquired the art from to ask if you can do these kinds of things. So right. that's just my two cents. Thank you, Ranjit. If you'd comment that I wanna to switch to a different subject, but Ranjit, you had something you wanted to say? No, I think Anu's expressed it quite well. I think it, it depends on the type of NFT. I think um, the, the example that comes to mind was um, an auction label that was sold. Um, and I just wonder how that would be displayed. Would you have a label for the label? Um, but no, I, I think Anu's expressed it really well. It depends on the type. Bill, yeah. I'd like to ask you, Bill, a question. Sure. Lighting. How do you achieve a dramatic effect? This is from the audience. Yeah, so you know, gallery lighting tracks, you know, doing all the big expense. How lighting is probably one of the hottest topics uh, because people want perfect lighting um, and they don't want to either spend money for it or they want to use it within a house. Uh, you know, in a home, you've got windows and uh, creating all sorts of secondary and tertiary light sources. Um, you know, when you're in a gallery setting, you control the lighting. You can write your first point, your secondary point. Um, I do a lot of lighting for clients within gallery situations and at the armories, uh, we'll go in and do our lighting. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult because, uh, you know, some of the best lit booths are plastered with track because what I think is going to work for the object. Um, and in my, you know, pea brain, I'm like, okay, I want, you know, raking light across this great schist object. And I set up the raking light. Now, all of a sudden I see all the ruddiness of the, of the, of the stone. Okay, I've got to back off four feet. Well, in a house, I don't have another track there. So it gets difficult, um, you know, to do, Lighting magic uh, is a very labor intensive uh, thing to do. Uh, it requires individual light control, individual placement. And again, some of the best lighting that's done is with a total grid of track that allows you to put lighting wherever you want. Sandra, I have a question from the audience. One, yeah. of, the, uh, one of the audience members noticed as I do how your eye travels across the overall tableau of the apartment, the location. 
so that the objects have a conversation with each other. Would you talk a little bit about how do you plan that and uh, you make that ha happen? Do you, you think about the relationship of those objects together and I, make plans in advance or how does it work? I call it the subconscious eye, all right? Um, a lot of clients come to me with, with you know, clips or Pinterest boards. And I tell them, I say, we're not doing a decorator's show house, all right? That, don't come to us if you want a room that's going to look like that and the other one's going to look like this. We do one, what we call a subconscious eye, that the subconscious eye travels through each room and it registers as you go through each room without you realizing it. That's what gives you the feeling of serenity. That's what gives you the feeling of a comprehensive interior. Um, but yes, it's a very conscious movement. Um, it's, it's, and, it, and it's a conversation that has to be considered very, very carefully. Does that, does that answer it? Yeah, I think that's helpful. And Ranji, you're, you have um, wonderful display resources and it's obvious you put a lot of time into your exhibitions and your objects seem to relate to each other. Could you talk about how you do that? Yeah, I think um, a personal mantra of mine is to, when I'm planning an exhibition, is to gather um, related objects. I think it helps the exhibition flow. Um, I think when you've got various different objects, and because I cover the whole of Asia, um, you know, if I've got objects from all over Asia and, and there's no linking theme, um, then I think it's it can be confusing to a visitor. So I do like to have small groups of related objects. So the exhibition tells a story. Um, and also visually, I think it can help um, if you're displaying um, similar items together. I think that that can help very well. Now, here's a question for any of you who wanna deal with this. What do you do with someone who has a collection of, let's say, coins or portrait miniatures or other high value small objects which they want to display? And they have a lot of them. You call Bill Stender Bill immediately. Stender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot of this, and I have a lot of clients. Like <laughs> I have a lot of clients who collect small objects, and, and I first start asking questions like, What's your, you know, are, is your house secure? Do you have any issues with children playing? You know, we have a lot of discussions. You know, we'll go in and they've got a Picasso vase on a pedestal in their front, in their front room. And they're like, I need you to make this rock solid because I have a four-year-old. Uh, so we deal with a lot of that, uh, you know, living with the art and yet protecting the art. Uh, so it does become a long-term discussion with the client and how they do it. Sometimes we'll make drawers. Um, right now I'm working with a client who has two uh, Enigma machines and he wants to display them uh, under glass. And he also has all the manuals and volumes. We're making drawers that go underneath the display case to hold all the technical volumes. So I get involved in a lot of, you know, I would say oddball things um, in my career, but I've mounted like over 15 Enigma machines. So who thought I would do that, you know? Do they know so, how to work them? No, no, um, but they're pretty neat to see, I gotta say. You know? I know. And then what do you, how, I have two questions for you, Anu. How would you, how do you do, how would you personally deal with these small objects where there are just so many of them and you want to have them in your home? What suggestions would you have? And then following up with that, what is the most difficult installation you've ever done? Um, all right, two very different questions. Um, for small <laughs> objects. <laughs> <laughs> for small objects, um, you know, typically at Sotheby's here for our exhibitions, we display them in cases. The previous question was about coins. Uh, we've displayed some, you know, very rare coins here, double eagle, for example, uh, you know, which stands like a very <clears throat> precious object inside its case, uh, kind of, you know, propped up on a, you know, like a velvet mount or something. 
Uh, in a home, you know, as Bill said, you, you would tend to keep them in drawers so that they were safe. Or perhaps Bill could design a sort of custom wall mount, if you will, a kind of museum style where you could at least place your favorite coins and, you know, view them without having to open a drawer all the time. I have, um, I have a Manhattan client who has just hundreds of, of bronze medallions. And they're anything from the size of a quarter to, you know, about that big. And we, he wants them literally on shelves. So what I created was a set of tiered shelves. So he, even on a 12 inch deep shelf, we've got multiple heights. So he can put a hundred medallions on an open shelf. And that's what he wanted. He didn't want them behind glass or in drawers. He wants to walk into the room and see them. So we start using layering and height to create uh, some visual interest um, because it could get really boring with you know hundreds of objects. But then if, if you're into those little objects, everyone's important to you. You don't want to put them behind a drawer. Uh, so there's ways of doing it. And I know what's the, what's the most difficult exhibition? Most of, the most yeah. challenging um, installation. Well, I was going to um, say, Lark, that every single one of them is challenging because in auction houses, unlike in museums, we don't have the benefit that curators do to you know, individually hand pick objects and then spend at least a year or three meticulously planning the exhibit. We have six months between one auction and the next, six months in which to gather property, catalog it, exhibit it and sell it. So at best, what we have are groupings. You have a grouping of Indian paintings, a grouping of bronzes, a grouping of tankas, and then you do the best you can to display it together so that there is some correlation between the objects. As far as a challenge, I would actually describe um, the season of March 2019 as being one of the most challenging. Uh, that was when more than half of our 10 story building on York Avenue was shut down for extensive renovations. And I had to squeeze, our team had to squeeze two auctions, so 200 objects into one floor. And one of them was modern and contemporary South Asian art, the other was Indian Himalayan Southeast Asian works of art. And while there is a cultural continuum here, the aesthetics are completely different. So to somehow put it all together in one space was really challenging. But what we did is that we, we were as creative as we possibly could be and we turned the challenge into something very enjoyable. So we put you know, different things together. We put Hussein painting together with Chola bronzes. We put Sousa painting together with miniatures. Uh, you know, we created this dialogue between different objects and so a challenge became something fun in the end but it was very, very, very stressful uh, to try and find a spot for every single thing in a small space. And we're, we're running out of time, but I wanna pose the same question roughly, a different twist to it a little bit to you, um, uh, Ranjit. Uh, do you have a kind of a fantasy project idea or challenge that you're thinking about? Something that's really unusual and you wanna put into play in, in an exhibit, Ranjit? Um, uh, to a wild fantasy is uh, a reenactment of a duel. So two warriors facing off against each other. Um, and so they would be very elaborate, uh, articulated mannequins in, in full action. <laughs> that would probably be my, yeah, no, I'll stick with that one. That would be my dream. <laughs> I think that sounds like a great dream. And uh, Sandra? What about you? I would love to go and see the new National Museum in Cairo. It's my dream wish. I cannot wait for it to open. And But who, does anybody know when it's going to open? They keep putting it off and off and off. Nobody knows, right? Yeah. It's my dream. But what about your dream installation? Oh, my that dream. You would create something that you haven't had a chance to do, but you're just itching to do. <laughs> well, one of my clients bought a painting. I can't tell you what it is due to the confidentiality agreement, but I am actually creating a room for this painting. And that is a, it's a dream that I never thought I would see during my lifetime or my career. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, I can't share more of it. No, that's okay. We look at one day, maybe we will. Bill, what about you? You've done so many things. There must be something that you're just slightly out of the grasp, but that you're thinking, wow, that would be interesting. What would I like to do? Yes. Oh boy, um, I've done so many things. Um, you know, and I've been all over the world to do projects. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's an odd business when somebody hires me uh, to have a three-hour consultation in Hong Kong. Uh, so uh, we we've done lots of different things. A dream project? Um, well, I tell you what, of all the presenters, um, I'm going to tip my hat to Ranjit. I think uh, some of his use of uh, color and art behind his objects is stunning. And I love uh, when I can get involved with someone like Ranjit, or I can get involved with someone like Sandra Nunnerly, or uh, and I can get involved with uh, you know, other designers who have sometimes great vision, uh, but they can't... Um, you know, make it realized. And I, so I'm that kind of nuts and bolts guy. I can, I can take, you know, kind of, in, in, some people would say crazy vision and make it happen. Uh, so floating uh, objects at the 9-11 Memorial, you know, museum started out, in, you know, uh, it was visceral. I was angry about it at first. Um, but at the same time, I was also working on a project in uh, Honolulu. And um, I, for the weekend, I went out to Pearl Harbor and I realized that Pearl Harbor, I was looking at it as history. It wasn't visceral to me, but 3000 people died there, but it was a beautiful park-like setting. So I, I realized that, you know, history, uh, time uh, calms things. And I, I took a very different uh, outlook as I went back to the 9-11 Memorial Museum making those mounts and displays that I was doing it for eternity. I was doing it for, you know, hundreds of years, these objects will be seen. And, and for some people, and even for my grandchildren, it's history. It's not a, it's not a scar in, my, in their lives. So, uh, you know, what great project, the next one somebody brings to me. And what a great end to this, but we have a, one more part, but I want to, you know, thank all of you for participating and note that it's the collaborative aspect of all this with the creativity that all of you bring to your projects that is just so phenomenal. And that is indeed what happens through Asia Week. So thank you, panelists. And we wait now for the chairman of Asia Week, Vesa Goddard, to say a few words. And thank you to you. You've been a great moderator. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Dessa Goddard, Chairman of Asia Week New York. I'd like to thank you all for attending this highly informative and exciting seminar on the arts of in installation and design. We're very grateful to Anu, Sandra, Ranjit, and Bill for their terrific presentations. We have an exciting year ahead as we continue to present more webinars and expanded viewing rooms and member activities and bring you information about important exhibitions, seminars, and events in the United States in our representative fields through our newsletter, What's Happening in Asian Art, and blogs as we build to March Asia Week, New York 2022. For those of you who have not subscribed to us, take a moment to do so, and thank you for your interest and support.